practices. Um, I'm Catherine Richmond. I'm chair of the membership committee of the ACC. So I'm very pleased to introduce Amy Axelrod Parker, senior counsel at Wilson Turner Cosmo, and Saba Zafar, senior counsel at Wilson Turner Cosmo. Uh, Wilson Turner has been a great partner to ACC San Diego. So we thank you very much for that to both of you. Um, I'm sure everyone has a lot of questions. If you do, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have the chat function enabled so that we can ask questions or um, obviously, Amy and Saba, if somebody wants to just interject, uh, hopefully that's fine too. Yes. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, so with that, I will send it over to our team at Wilson Turner and we'll get started on this. Um, obviously, this is something that is always timely, regardless of what is going on in the state of California. Wage and hour is always an issue. So we uh, very much appreciate you both for your time. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Catherine, for the warm introduction. Um, I know Amy and I are both excited to be here and to present on this topic. Um, as Catherine mentioned, my name is Seba Zephyr. I'm a senior counsel at Wilson Turner Cosmo. I've been an employee I'm an attorney for more than a decade and, you know, been on both plaintiffs and defense sides. So when I'm providing advice or talking about these topics, I always think about, well, what would I have done as a plaintiff's attorney? So it always comes with that. Um, but we're very excited, again, to be here. And Amy, do you want to? Yes, I'll jump in. It's great to be here, like Saba said. And it's great to see so many of you uh, familiar faces and names. I'll be counting on you, Amber and Sierra, to jump in with good questions or um, advice based on your experience. I have been representing businesses of all shapes and sizes since 2007, focused on employment practices, mostly litigation, um, but a lot of counseling as well. And uh, with the new um, updates to PAGA, we thought it would be a time a good time to go over wage and hour audit best practices. Yeah, so um, you know, we're going to do a more superficial overview of what an audit looks like. As Amy said, we invite you to jump in and ask questions because I'm sure there will be questions as we're going along. So what we're planning on cover today is why you should conduct an audit, um, what portions of the business or business practices you should audit from an employment or wage and hour perspective, and then best practices as you're completing that audit. Now, so uh, when it, go, sorry, go ahead. Um, a lot, lot of businesses may question what is the value of an audit? It's expensive, it's distracting from the business, you have other things to do. Well, there are a lot of good answers for why audit, um, avoiding risk of individual class or collective actions, um, particularly under PAGA. Um, reducing the impact of agency investigations. We've seen a great uptick in local, state, and federal agency involvement in enforcement in wage and hour um, law and lots of investigations, requests for information, and that is a laborious process that can result in penalties. And as we're all aware, recent settlement and verdicts are always inspiration um, to conduct an audit to mitigate risk and try to make some corrections, self-corrections if possible before litigation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is an amended version of PAGA and um, there we could spend a whole hour or multiple hours just talking about that. But in, in basic terms, please note that there is an expanded right to cure and employees have rights to injunctive relief, which means a court could order policy changes, um, you know, or policies to be stopped. In the new PAGA, if an employer has a regular practice of conducting audits, um, cleaning up their practices, making corrections, ensuring that supervisors are trained, then 
if there is a PAGA claim, they can reduce penalties to 15%, one five, 15% of what they would otherwise be. And now this is only if you're making corrections before a PAGA notice. If you receive a PAGA notice and you make these corrections or any corrections within 60 days of that notice, you also are limiting or capping your liability for PAGA penalties under the new statute. So that's pretty inspiring. If, if you've been involved in a PAGA lit litigation, you know that uh, the goal is to avoid them. Sava. Yeah, so I think planning an audit based on just avoiding PAGA penalties is a great motivating factor. Um, I mean, we, we always want to do the right thing, but I think it's a great motivating factor if you've been in any PAGA lawsuits. I'm sure that this is really good news for you. Um, so when you are planning an audit, what you really want to kind of think about is what are the company's objectives, right? And that might depend on how large the company is. You've got some smaller companies where they can handle an audit very easily, and maybe they can actually audit everything related to every single employee, right? Um, then you've got companies that are hundreds of thousands of employees, and then you're, you really have to look at what objectives are important for the company, or and then whether the audit needs to be broken into several different sections, right? We're going to do a little bit of wage and hour, a little bit of um, employment law as far as notices, policies, whether we're complying with that, termination, what that looks like. So you really need to kind of, I think, in that regard, determine the scope of your audit. Um, and then as you're doing this, especially if you're working with an attorney um, or not working with an attorney, you have to consider attorney-client privilege, privilege coverage. Um, if possible, and if your team allows it, if your business is big enough, you want to enlist a team of people because several eyes on documents is always better than one. Um, and also audits can be very time intensive. So to that extent, you do want to make sure to the extent possible you have a team working with you. Um, you also want to look at the data sources you have. So for example, in wage and hour, you might have wage statements, you might have timesheets, and then you might have data reports that your payroll company can print out, right? So you, in that regard, you, as you're planning an audit, you want to think about, okay, what are sources of documents that we can look at and analyze so that you are making sure you're hitting all the points of the audit. Um, you also want to document the steps of an audit and what you're doing in writing, because as Amy mentioned, the new PAGA, the new and improved PAGA, thank you, California legislatures, um, will look at whether or not you do audits regularly, right? Um, and that does help decrease your PAGA exposure. So you want to document your audits and make sure that's done. And then at the end, based on what you find, um, you want to evaluate what, if any, remedial measures are available. For example, if overtime is not getting paid properly because there's a coding error in your payroll system, okay, are we going to fix that? How are we going to fix that? How does that impact the rest of the company and our practices? So it's really important as you're looking at an audit um, to kind of plan these things out beforehand. And if any of you um, need help getting buy-in from the business on conducting an audit, you know, we, we can provide advice on, on how to approach that. Um, but essentially you wanna, you know, outline the cost of the audit, the cost of corrections, and compare that to the risk of exposure for liability on wage and hour issues. And so when we're talking about audit topics, I mean, really, it, it can be very, very extensive. But I think some of the more common topics are the ones that you see listed on the screen. Um, you want to make sure your employee files are up to date. As we all know, California has several different codes that requires employers to maintain employee files. And then remember, there's a portion of the employee file with medical or other documents that are in the confidential file, right? So we want to make sure that employee files are being um, 
kept up regularly. So signed documents are in there, confidential documents are somewhere else, safe, away from everyone else. You know, that employees have been given either in an employee handbook or some sort of policy manual required policies that California has, such as harassment, discrimination, retaliation, wage and hour orders. Um, we want to make sure all of those are either dispersed to employees or to the extent allowed, they are posted somewhere. Um, when it comes to hiring and onboarding, we also want to make sure that that process looks um, streamlined, but also legal. Um, in the past few years, we've had several changes to questions we can ask for hiring, right? We can no longer ask about someone's prior salary. There are limitations to what, if anything, we can ask regarding criminal history, right? You can't ask about criminal history until unless there's a conditional offer of employment now. Back in the day, it was in the application. It was absolutely okay. So you want to make sure that you're hiring packets from application to onboarding are all legal, right? Um, job descriptions are also really important. Um, we often find that there are job descriptions that look great. And then when you start talking to employees and ask them what they do day to day, what they do day to day is very different from what's in a job description. And I'll talk about that later, but that kind of goes into exemptions and whether an employee is exempt or not. So it's really important. Um, as you're conducting an audit to also look at job descriptions. Um, we also want to make sure that we have, you know, all the training that we're either required to do by California law, such as harassment um, trainings, um, but also if the company has other trainings itself that it does voluntarily, whether it's training for specific work or, you know, how to talk to your for your you know your co-workers how to interact with each other in the workplace um that you're actually auditing that and to make sure that people are actually taking those trainings and to the extent that you're late just making sure that you know you're asking people to complete those um from a payroll and timekeeping perspective again you want to make sure that you're complying with the various labor codes, depending on what type of employees you have. Um, and from the payroll perspective, you want to make sure that it's timely. Um, and again, from the and then that ties into timekeeping as far as making sure that every single minute of an, a non-exempt employee's work is being, you know, tracked somehow. Um, and whether you do that with a paper, you know, timesheet, which I think has become very cumbersome these days, or, you know, an electronic timekeeping software, and there are lots of great ones out there. It's important to make sure that whatever you're using does comply with California law, because oftentimes there are products out there where, you know, I often get this question where it's, I'll tell someone, hey, that product doesn't do X, Y, and Z, or it doesn't say calculate the regular rate of pay. And people will say, well, it's a, you know, it's a big company, it should do that. I'm like, I know, but it doesn't. And it's unfortunately on you to make sure that whatever product you might be using does comply with California law. Next on our list, we have wage statements. I think many of us are familiar with how tricky those can be. Labor Code Section 226A lists a number of items, nine or 11, um, that may apply and, um, it's a good idea to audit those from time to time. And cautionary tale, I think this will come up more than once during this presentation, but if you are using a PEO um, or you know a third party employer or a payroll company to produce wage statements, even if you have indemnification provisions, please, please consult your uh, local ordinances, state and federal law to ensure that um, the calculations are accurate, that all the components that must be on a wage statement are there, and to keep up with any changes to those requirements. Commission agreements, they must be in writing. They must be kept somewhere that you can get to them. Um, same with expense reimbursements. We are seeing more 2802 claims um, popping up again and um, you know, after a little dip 
when people were working from home during the pandemic, um, th those issues are cropping up again. Paid sick leave and uh, use and accrual. You know, this also is an item that needs to be included on your wage statements and ensure that it's actually being tracked accurately. Industry specific requirements. If you're in healthcare, if you are in um, retail there, or construction, there are a number of industry specific requirements um, for record keeping. I mentioned RIF business cases, not because there's any particular statute that says you have to keep these handy, but as a litigator and as someone who deals with um, employment separation negotiations all of the time, um, it's advisable to have your business cases in writing in the files for anyone impacted by a reduction in force or layoff. And that leads, of course, to termination documentation. Um, a checked box in a screenshot from your payroll system is not sufficient. Um, we want to be able to justify the termination and ensure that all of the forms and handouts that are required to be given to the employee are in a timely manner. And I should mention that uh, all companies need to consider data, privacy, and how they're keeping this information to ensure that it's actually secured. What about electronic communication, Saba? Companies that use Slack or instant messages of any kind, emails even, uh, what do you say about that? I think emails are a requirement, obviously, especially when you have so many people working remotely and you can't go down the hall. Um, Slack, I think can be in, in my in my experience with litigation can become problematic because people tend to use it very personally and they become very comfortable with it. And a, a lot of tech companies love Slack. Um, but what I find is whenever there's a case, you know, I there that's where you'll find the the, the messages that might um, help a plaintiff's case. Um, as I went to a presentation um, several months ago for the Los Angeles County Bar Association, they said, your case is in the text messages. Um, and to the extent that companies have electronic communications, I think the cases and maybe the electronic communications, um, to that extent, I think companies need to have really good policies for what company electronic communications should be used for, which is for business purposes, right? It shouldn't be used to violate any policy, such as to harass someone, to make fun of someone, bully someone. Um, and so I think when we're looking at record keeping and electronic communications, you also have to audit that as well to make sure that whatever um, company uh, policies are, that the electronic communications or any technology or resources a company has, it's being used in alignment with those policies. I agree, Saba. And uh, we have clients that have um, document retention policies that range from 60 days, meaning two months ago, your emails, you know, that's all you've got and then other clients that never delete a thing. And each of those scenarios can result in different challenges. Um, so really take a look at your business and think about how evidence might be useful or might be damaging. Now in contrast, Saba, I was gonna give this one to you, um, but since I'm already on it, is there anyone who who is not familiar with the litigation hold? I think we're all lawyers in this room. If there's a litigation hold, just note that those instructions will supersede um, and be more um, protective of information than the law. Um, and I should mention, I would say to be safe, you keep things for seven years. There are varying, you know, amounts of time that you need to keep things. But you know, if you were in a big litigation, you'll want to go back that far. Um, but I just wanted to make that note. That nothing we're talking about has to do with information that you're preserving based on a litigation hold. Saba? 
And so that takes us to one of my favorite topics when I'm helping a client perform an audit, which is always, um, are we classifying workers properly, right? Um, as much as ABC has been publicized, as Dynamics has been publicized, I routinely get the question of, um, if the person agrees to be an independent contractor, can I classify them as such? And I always say no. Um, that is not the standard we're looking at. So the first thing we always want to look at, and I'm actually doing this for a client right now, is are employees classified properly as an employee versus an independent contractor? And for that, we always want to look at the ABC test, right? And it has become increasingly difficult in California to literally classify anyone as an independent contractor. Um, AB 2257 does have a list, a pretty giant list actually, of exemptions, but a lot of those exemptions you will see are for professionals, they're for the entertainment industry, I wonder why. Um, and you know they don't quite apply to regular businesses, so we can always take a look at those, but generally speaking, most, are, most workers providing services are employees. So the first thing you want to look at is to the extent the company might have any independent contractors, are we misclassifying them? Or um, are we comfortable with that classification? Are we comfortable with that risk? Because remember, um, because we live in California, all someone has to do is file a lawsuit. And now suddenly we're paying X amount of money in a settlement just to avoid litigation costs. Um, once we have determined that, okay, these this is these group of people, yes, they're employees. The second thing to look at is, are they properly classified as an exempt or a non-exempt employee? And again, I'm always surprised by this question, but people ask, can I just give them a salary and make them an exempt employee? Unfortunately, no, we can't do that. Um, not in California law. There's a separate federal law about that that California law supersedes. Um, but when we're looking at exemptions, what we're really, you know, we're looking at the three big exemptions. We have the professional exemption, me, Amy, a bunch of doctors out there, accountants, right? Um, licensed professionals, basically. Then you've got the executive exemption where you have someone in an actual supervisory role. They're spending more than 50% of their time actually supervising people, more than two full-time people. This is where the job descriptions kind of come into play that I was mentioning earlier, is oftentimes when I'm kind of auditing this for a client, they'll hand me the job description and the job description looks great. I'm like, yeah, this looks exempt on paper. What is this person doing day to day though, right? Are they actually spending more than 50% of their tasks in, non, in, in an exempt manner? Or is it non-exempt, right? Um, so it's that's why it's really important to audit those job descriptions and make sure that they're actually accurate. Um, and then with and then of course, if we find that's you know this a position that used to be exempt for whatever reason years later has become non-exempt, and we do need to reclassify them, then there's a discussion of what's the best way to do this to avoid a lawsuit. Right, um, Labor Code 206.5 comes into play. If you don't know what that says is, you can't get a release from someone by paying them the money that's owed. So it's not always very easy to reclassify people, but we of course help our clients do that regularly um, and do it successfully. Um, the very last thing to talk about are gig workers, which I'll let Amy talk about. Yes, it's hard to know what companies employ gig workers anymore. Um, when I say gig workers, I'm especially meaning app-based workers um, who now after Castellanos 3, I think it was, and Olson, um, are con constitutionally categorized um, as independent contractors with some benefits. And there are a lot of requirements to be compliant with Prop 22. If you're not 100% compliant with those, then you lose um, the presumption of independent contractor status and you're at square one. And of course, you've got to be mindful of your employees who are exempt or your independent contractors not having time records, 
not having data that correspond to what they're doing necessarily. Um, so in those cases, plaintiffs can often use their flapping gums as evidence of, of how uh, much they worked. And the company's got a challenge to um, try to rebut that case. Amy, I'm so sorry. I did not cover the administrative exemption. And I want to talk about it very quickly because it is the most misleading exemption. Um, it is called the administrative exemption. So I get questions all the time. Well, this is an administrative assistant. They can be part of the exemption, right? Absolutely not. Um, we're usually talking about someone who's pretty... Um, kind of really high high up there in your organization. They are leading an HR department, an accounting department, um, and they are intimately involved in your business and policy decisions. Um, so be very careful of classifying anyone under the administrative exemption. It's actually much harder than it seems. Um, and then with, with that, Amy, I'll send it back to you. Yeah, and just on that point as well, remember that you're going to want to essentially audit an employee, a particular employee's records, if you suspect that the, they have been misclassified and hopefully make the kinds of corrections that will um, address or, or preclude any substantial liability. Equal pay, you could do an audit simply on this topic. And I have had several cases on this topic in the last couple of years. And um, there are a lot of different things to look at, but Essentially, you want those accurate job descriptions. Once again, you want to take a look at um, the amount of experience that people in parallel job roles have, their tenure, whether they have some kind of specialization or something out of the ordinary with regard to their performance that can be documented um, to justify any differentials in compensation. And that is compensation of all kinds, not just salary, but bonuses, perks, that kind of thing as well. And that brings us to working hours, right? Um, not enough hours in the day ever. As most of you probably know, California's various wage orders allow and require employers to set their work weeks, work days. And so what does that mean? So basically, um, an employer can set any seven day period as their work week. It could be Monday to Sunday, Tuesday to Monday, whatever they want. And that, that's pretty flexible. Um, setting your work week and your work day is really important for overtime pay. Um, now, what becomes a little bit more tricky is a work day. Most of the time, employers are, they can just set any 24 hour period as their work day, so long as they can justify it, right? There's a business necessity there. Most employers choose a midnight to midnight work day for two reasons. Um, number one, it gives them a really good boundary, right? Number two, believe it or not, most payroll companies don't know what to do with the work day. That is, say, for example, 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. the next day. Um, this is important because overtime has to get paid per based on the number of hours that an employee works within a work day and a work week. So, and for those of you who might have overnight shifts at your companies, you don't pay employees by their shift. And this is very confusing to employees. And it's always a good idea to have a presentation for them and sit down with them and explain to them why when they're working overnight on Monday and the work week ends, why they're not getting paid for those four more hours after midnight um, in their the paycheck they've just received. And they're going to get paid the following work week. Um, there have been challenges to work days, which is why I say the midnight to midnight is generally the safest. Um, the most, the most I think, well-known one is probably the Starbucks challenge, um, because Starbucks's work day is 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. And so employees challenge that saying, hey, I think you're trying to um, not pay us overtime, right? Because not paying employees overtime is not a reason, by the way, to um, kind of set your work day at any particular um, work day. And Starbucks said, no, we like a 6 a.m. work day because that's when our stores open. 
that's it. And the judge said, yeah, that makes sense, right? So it, it makes sense for something like that. But if you're a 24-hour business, then you're just, then you really have to look at the midnight to midnight. Again, a lot of payroll companies have problems trying to pay employees outside of that midnight to midnight um, workday. So be very careful about how you're, um, more than your work week, how you're characterizing your work day. Um, then, of course, we have the wonderful alternative work schedules. Um, as you know, California says, hey, you can go ahead and um, have a 410 work schedule um, uh, or other alternatives out there. But it's not as easy as an employer saying, hey, we're going to have an alternative work week schedule. You actually need to create an entire plan. Um, provide a notice to your employees to say, hey, we're going to hold a meeting to discuss this plan and then separately have a voting for that, right? So it's, it's pretty complicated. And then um, the rules on, on that are pretty tough as well. So you really want to think about whether an alternative work week works for you. So for example, if you have a 410 work week, um, if, you're, if you're not providing someone 10 hours a day, they're working nine hours a day, guess what? Any time worked over eight hours becomes overtime. So you have to be really careful about whether an alternative work week, one, works for you. And if you do decide it works for you, you have to make sure that you follow every single step. And I definitely didn't mention any of those, but if any of you have questions, Amy and I are happy to answer them. Absolutely. Be also uh, mindful if you have on-call employees or split shifts, there are a lot of different scenarios that, uh, you know, require detailed analysis to see how they shake out over time. Speaking of time, you want to audit your timekeeping practices. There are so many different um, methods now to clock in and out, um, to use biometric information, that kind of thing. Again, um, it's a good idea to audit how that information is stored, how it can be accessed and such. Um, time rounding. I wish I could just tell the world, please stop rounding the time. Just pay them for every minute they work and not any minute more. Um, it does cause problems in litigation and it's essentially unlawful unless you are giving the employee a windfall, in my opinion. Um, meal periods, ensure that those are tracked. Ensure that they are occurring before the end of the fifth hour of work and that they are 30 minutes uninterrupted or you're paying uh, an hour's worth of wages as a premium for not having a legally compliant meal break. I've seen a lot of cases where we say, we always give a meal break. If you don't give a meal break, we give you an automatic penalty. But guess what? They didn't start with it before the end of the fifth hour of work. So it doesn't even count. Coffee badging. Uh, I picked up this term um, recently, and um, apparently it's ubiquitous these days. People will swipe their badge to get in the door, grab a cup of coffee, and then disappear. Um, you want to be mindful of that and manage performance to address these issues and don't turn a blind eye because it can add up and cause a problem. Um, likewise, you don't want employees doing any off the clock work. Audit any of the activities pre and post shift that employees based on their job descriptions are required to do or are doing, and you have the employer has reason to know that they're doing, that time must be paid. Think about um, waiting in line for security, um, what, having a long walk from the parking lot, you know, any kind of irregularity in getting into the workplace and getting to their assigned, um, you know, work area should be evaluated. There also is a recent decision finding that the time spent by an employee while they waited for their computer to boot up for their whatever system they were using to pop up on their screen, and that was compensable time and penalties were owed because it hadn't been paid timely. Speaking of penalties, Let's talk about meal and rest breaks. Um, as Amy mentioned, we want to make sure that employees are taking meal periods before the end of their fifth hour. Um, I 
often see pe people start their meal periods at exactly the fifth hour. And there's some argument that maybe that's okay. Um, and, but at the end of the day, most plaintiff's attorneys that I know will argue, for example, if you're starting, um, you know, say your end of the fifth hour is 11.59, that your employee should begin their meal period at 11.59 and that it's late by noon. So you definitely just want to, knowing that there there's argument exists, you want to make sure that you err on the side of caution. Um, general meal period rules are that you know, you get, if you're working, say, eight hours, you get one meal period, or if you're working 10 hours, you get two meal periods, right? They're at least 30 minutes each. Um, and most everyone, I think, who has at least electronic timekeeping does a good job of kind of look, notating the exact minute the person has started their meal period. Um one of the things that we've started seeing are meal period attestations, which I think are such a great tool to make sure that when employees meal periods are short or late or they don't take them, we get some information about what happened so that we can determine whether or not a penalty needs to get paid. Um, number one, it's always a good idea to pay the penalty instead of getting into that argument of, well, they told the supervisor that they chose to do this. When we're looking at the attestations though, I don't know if any of you, probably most of you are familiar, we had that wonderful Donahue case that said, look, in that particular case, they had an electronic timekeeping, the drop down menu, all it allowed, all it allowed an employee to do was say, I took my meal period and it was 30 minutes long. And the court said, that's not sufficient. You need to give employees the option to say, I didn't take my meal period, it wasn't 30 minutes long, and I have to come back early because my supervisor is making me work, right? So if you are going to have attestations, whether you've got paper attestations, which are really difficult to deal with, or whether you have electronic attestations, and you want to make sure that they, it's, a, it's a complete attestation. And, you know, I welcome you to read the wonderful Donahue case um, because it actually does set forth for you what an attestation looks like. It's great. Um, then, of course, we have meal period waivers. These are allowed. So if an employee is working less than six hours, they can voluntarily waive their, waive, waive their meal period. Um, for this one, oftentimes employers have employees sign something when they first start working during onboarding. And I have a lot of plaintiffs attorneys arguing that this um, blank waiver is not sufficient for random meal periods that an employee might miss. So you might want to consider whether you want a waiver the day that the employee misses their meal period voluntarily, right? Um, if an employee is working 10 hours a day and they've taken their first meal period, they can also wait, then they can wait their second meal period, right? Um, but if they haven't taken their first meal period, they can't take, wait the second one. Um, and then we've got on-duty meal periods, which I think still don't exist in California. Um, it is a very, very high standard um, to convince a court that your on-duty meal period agreement is valid. Um, and it's mainly because the, the, the work has to be such or the location has to be such that the employee cannot take a meal period. Um, courts have said that, you know, we're a remote gas station very far away where no one can go relieve someone. That sort of thing can be a place where you have on-duty meal periods. So when you're considering whether or not you should have an on-duty meal period and whether it's valid, you want to look at whether, you know, if somebody else can relieve the employee. Um, how, you know, how, how important is the task that the person is doing? Um, I always say that unless they're transporting um, a kidney, maybe don't have an on-duty meal period because plaintiff's attorneys will get you on that. I see we have a couple of questions um, in our chat. Yes. So the first one, these are both great questions from Deborah. How do you suggest employees handle computer warm up time for employees working remotely? That is an interesting and very timely question. So generally speaking, it takes a couple of minutes maybe to boot up. 
Um, if people are still doing that, I, I generally just hit control, alt, delete. Um, don't tell our IT department. But um, I would routinely ask employees to let you know if they have any kind of uh, computer or system issue that is taking more than a couple of minutes um, to get started. And it's also not a bad idea to just add five minutes to somebody's time if you're concerned about this being, you know, something that's widespread. Um, hopefully systems can be improved so that it doesn't take so long. Now about the second meal period, Saba, the question from Arlene um, is, does the time yeah. counter 10 hours exclude the 30 minute meal period? I have some yeah. thoughts based on Brinker, but I'll let you. It, it does. It does. Um, so when we're looking at the work hours, we're, we're, we're looking at hours worked. We are not looking at meal periods. So the if so, for example, if somebody's worked nine, like say nine and a half hours um, and they've taken a 30 minute meal period, that's sufficient. I'm um, for me, at least. Um, and then so what but now what I didn't talk about are rest breaks. Rest breaks are included in worked hours. So you don't want to deduct that 20 minutes of the two rest breaks that they take. But you're not looking at um, meal periods that they've taken or any any other time. Right. So um, early your, your question is more about, I think, am I looking at the shift or the hours worked? And you're not looking at the shift, you're looking at the hours worked. Any other questions on these topics so far? We definitely want anyone who has questions. Um, you guys have the opportunity to jump in. All right, we'll keep going. All right, compensation. This is another one of my favorite topics only because I like math. Um, so we all know the usual, you know, pay employees for all hours worked. We, we also wanna make sure that we're paying them for those other situations, right? So you've got reporting time pay. Someone shows up to work and you say, you know what, it's been really slow today. I'm gonna go ahead and send you home. Right, that person's entitled to reporting time pay, which is at least two hours of their pay, but not more than four hours of their pay. Um, meal periods and rest breaks. If they are missing their meal periods or rest breaks, um, then you want to, you know, make sure that employees during that same pay period. By the way, so there was a new law. It's got to be the same period. We can't do it later. Um, in, the, in the wage statement for that pay period, you have to make sure you're paying premiums for missed meal periods and rest breaks at the regular rate of pay. I'm going to come back to that. Um, we want to make sure that employees are paid at least minimum wage for all hours worked. Um, one time when we have issues with minimum wage is employees are paid piece rate. And think about a masseuse, right? Um, a masseuse is paid piece rate. Um, and it used to be that they, you know, you just pay them for whatever appointments they had. It's kind of okay. Um, but then there was a, an amendment to the labor code, maybe like seven or eight years ago, that said that, look, you can't just pay people reporting not uh, their piece rate. You also need to pay them for that waiting time in between, right? So that's where you want to make sure that in total, whatever that person is receiving in payment, because depending on how long it takes them to complete that task, they're getting paid minimum wage at least. And that's a really good thing to audit. Um, you want to make sure employees are getting paid overtime if they're working so long as we don't have an alternate work week schedule. They're working more than eight hours a day, more than 40 hours a week, seventh consecutive day in the same work week, they're getting paid overtime. Right, they're getting paid double time if they're working more than 12 hours a day um, or more than eight hours a day on the seventh consecutive day on the in the same work week. It's really important to look at that work week, right? Um, that brings me to the regular rate of pay, which is, I think the legislature wanted to do something good for employees. Um, I think the effect is that it's so complicated sometimes that a lot of employers say, eh, we're, we're just not going to give that mandatory bonus um, because 
it, I don't want to calculate the regular rate of pay any, uh, at, at any time. So regular rate of pay, what it basically is, is when an employee receives additional compensation that is non-discretionary, such as commissions, incentives, or a piece rate, um, generally not holiday bonuses, um, but they're year-end bonuses if they're large, um, then you take that amount, and depending on what type of payment it is, there are several different formulas for the regular rate of pay, you have to recalculate what their actual rate is. Um, RSUs are not in the regular rate of pay usually, um, but we probably want to look at the very specific situation that you're talking about, Deborah. Most of the time they're not. Um, so what, and then what you do is you, you divide it by the hours worked, right? Um, as I mentioned, there are several different formulas out there. Um, and the DIR website does a semi-good job of some of those formulas, other formulas lie in case law. So it's always a good idea to talk to an attorney about it. Um, but what do you do with the regular rate of pay? Uh, well, overtime should be paid at the regular rate of pay. So for example, someone is generally paid $20 an hour. Um, they receive a bonus because they refer to a friend there. And then for that week, their regular rate of pay is $22 an hour. Um, their overtime is not 20 times 1.5, it's 22 point times 1.5. Um, their an employee's meal period and rest break gets paid at the regular rate of pay. An employee's sick leave gets paid at the regular rate of pay. So as you're thinking about additional compensation for your employees, which is a good thing to do, it is good for morale, um, just make sure that you are also looking at how the um, regular rate of pay is um, is going to be calculated. Uh, word to the wise, a lot of payroll companies are not great at calculating the regular rate of pay. So oftentimes you have to do it manually and then enter it. Um, Deborah, I, I saw your, I addressed your questions a little bit. So restricted stock units are generally not part of the regular rate of pay, but it all depends on what's going on. Um, also, most of the time, by the way, the restrict our RSUs, they're usually awarded to exempt employees, which is probably why it doesn't come up. But um, to the it really just depends on the agreement. Um, are we looking at an option? Um, they they I, I'm sh I, I know they are. Um, I think there are arguments on both sides. It also depends on um, when the RSUs are awarded, right? So it depends on the actual agreement. Um, Google. So I will say that most of the time that I've seen RSUs get paid out has been for exempt employees. So I think the answer is it depends on the agreement when they're getting paid out. And as defense attorneys, um, we would like to argue that RSUs aren't part, or shouldn't be included in the regular rate of pay. Um, but as you can see, commissions are included in the regular rate of pay. Um, so long as, by you know, there's no exemption out there. So it's possible, but I would like to argue otherwise. I'm sure we'll have a case um, about that soon. Yeah, I actually, in April or May, settled a case where a major component of the claim was um, stock options um, that this person didn't receive because they were terminated. And all the research that I could come up with indicated they would not be included. They're not compensation um, at all, but that's an item I think I think we should watch. Um, Saba just explained, and we've mentioned the cautionary tale. Um, you know, we we've represented payroll companies. I know, you know, Amber, for example, has as well. Um, and do as good as they may, they are not the experts on what is included on the wage statement. So do please look at um, code compliance with 226. And frequently what we see are um, mistakes in calculations over time, the regular rate of pay, 
as you all know about um, paid sick leave, accruals or use not being listed on the wage statement, um, the correct legal name of the business entity is often missing or the address is missing. Each of these highly technical components can cause, depending on how many employees you have and how long you've been in business, hundreds of thousands of dollars in liability that a quick audit, um, maybe not so quick, but a real audit would be able to avoid entirely. And keep in mind, if you do get a PAGA notice, you've got 60 days to make some corrections to really reduce um, your risk of liability. All right, this is probably my least favorite topic. Um, I do like I do like math more than performance management. I'll say that. Um, but performance management is important, right? And it's important for it to be uniform. And it's important for it to happen regularly, um, and it's important for people uh, at you know in the right positions to do audits to make sure that um, the right people are actually performance managing their team, right? Um, performance management happens in a lot of different forums. It depends on your company policy um, for, and a lot of different things trigger it, right? Sometimes we've just got annual performances and that's all employees will ever hear. Um, and some other companies, they might have monthly performance um, kind of meetings and one-on-ones. Um, it is really important to document performance, whether it is good or bad. Because remember, similarly situated employees need to be treated similarly. Um, and so oftentimes what happens is, you know, there's a great employee who is absolutely fantastic and the supervisor says, oh, that's a pretty big mistake, but they're so great. I'm not going to manage them. Um, and then it keeps happening and they're not managing them. And they're like, oh, we should maybe terminate this person, but we haven't documented anything. And then that person goes on a medical leave and then they come back and they're like, hey, we want to let you go. They come to me and Amy and we say, well, did you document their performance issues, right? And then the answer is no, because they're such a great employee, we didn't want to lose them. Um, there are some amazing coaches out there who I think um, help employers talk to employees about performance management when they don't feel comfortable doing it. And so I think there's lots of great tools and resources out there that you can use to make sure that you are kind of providing regular feedback, periodic reviews. Um, and then of course, you've got investigations, right? When you have an employee um, complaining about something, anything that could be a violation of the law, um, violation of your policies, it's a good idea to do an investigation internally. Um, sometimes the issue is serious enough where I say hire an outside counsel or an outside investigator to do the investigation. Um, for many reasons, including you might want a neutral party making a decision. Um, and then of course, when needed, you it's always a good idea to issue corrective action and discipline. Absolutely. And um, this topic leads right into the next one, leaves of absences and accommodations. It's amazing how many cases in the last, I'd say four years, five years, I've had um, involving um, leaves taken uh, as an accommodation and not as an entitlement um, based on their tenure under FMLA or whatever it is. Um, it, it's a really, really important um, area because a lot of liability can issue from, you know, messing this up. And, you know, you're already presumably dealing with a plaintiff that has some medical condition or disability, and they can make for very sympathetic plaintiffs. And, you know, usually the employer bears the burden of having all the ducks in a row, everything documented, including the poor performance preceding uh, the leave of absence. Um, you wanna take a look at all of your forms, um, have them handy, and ensure that the communications are appropriate for the messages given and that they're consistent based on different people over time and what departments they're in and that kind of thing. 
Another cautionary tale, many businesses have third-party administrators of leaves and accommodations. That is fantastic. However, you've got to have a good job description that has the physical components of the job already on there so that, you know, there's no argument that someone came up with some kinds of essential functions of the job after somebody already went on leave. Um, you want to ensure that there's communication between yourself if you're you know the responsible attorney or your hr manager whoever it is they need to have appropriate communications that show not just give in a you know the interactive process but demonstrate in writing that an interactive process was was um, implemented and that both sides are equally participating in that in order to determine whether there's a reasonable accommodation short of leave or whether continued leave is reasonable under the circumstances. Um, in other words, please don't rely on your third party leave administrator to do all of that for you. They have their own obligations that hopefully they're holding up, but you need to uphold yours. Okay, in the, in the so last couple of minutes that we have, I'm going to quickly cover termination practices by saying similarly situated employees need to be treated similarly. It is very important that you have a as uniform as possible of a policy to treat um, terminations. You want when when you're tr when you're deciding when to terminate someone, you have to look at you know what the risk is if they've engaged in a protected activity, and then you have to do a little bit more investigation and say is someone trying to get you to fire this person because they didn't like that they engaged in a protected activity. Do we have a defensible claim here? Um, so those things are important. We want to make sure final wages are ready. Um, and to the extent that we want to offer them a severance, that a severance agreement is ready for them to review. They, they're they aware that an attorney can review it. Um, for older workers, to the extent that we are looking to waive an ADEA claim, claim for age discrimination, we want to include that 21 day to review the agreement, seven days to revoke. Um, Non-compete, non-solicitation, as you know, um, kind of gone in California, except that you have a right to protect your confidential information to the extent that you are telling someone you cannot use my confidential information, my trade secrets, um, to compete with me or solicit my clients. That is still okay. Yeah, we could do a whole hour just on that topic. I have a lot of thoughts on that. If anyone has um existing non-compete, non-solicitation provisions in their um, onboarding or any kinds of agreements, please contact us to discuss. Um, Arlene asked another great question. Do we have opinions on what items must be audited in order to satisfy the PA amended PAGA's requirement about reasonable steps to take advantage of this cure provisions? I would love to prepare one. I I don't have one handy. Certainly everything that goes on the wage statement, um, everything about calculations of compensation, work day, work week, um, overtime schedule, that kind of thing. Um, paid sick leave, I, I think is a, a big topic that's, um, you know, often missed and can be, you know, subject to a public claim. Um, Get back to me, Arlene, and I'll I'll, I'll make a more formal list because I think that's a great idea. And then our next slide is just going over, um, you know, our audit practices. You want to make a checklist. What are you auditing? What is the scope? Um, have forms to the extent that you can um, to help the process move along. And if you have people on your team, so that it's consistently carried out. Consider a cadence for audits if your business is um, interested in taking advantage of the opportunities that audits can provide. Doing them periodically, regularly, at least once a year, I believe is, is advisable. Um, make sure that audits are documented, but again, be careful about attorney-client privilege issues or work pro product issues. If you are involving an attorney or are conducting the audit at 
the, you know, the, with the guidance of an attorney, um, keep in mind that you'll want to divide privileged and non-privileged information so that you can use documentation from your audit and findings without getting the actual communications and advice wrapped up together. And consider your self-correction options. Um, you know, be careful what you wish for. If you are going to do an audit, be prepared to make corrections. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be developing evidence uh, against the company essentially without, um, you know, having remedial measures. So when you get buy-in for an audit, get buy-in for remedial measures. Um, and we can certainly help anyone who has questions about that. Any other um, questions on these topics before we call it a day? And again, um, Audrey from ACC will be sending out a link to the presentation. We welcome any questions. Um, as you can see here, our email addresses, um, or you can go to Wilson Turner's website and find us there um, to connect. If there are no other questions, we thank you so kindly for participating in today's presentation. Thank you to the ACC for hosting us and inviting us to present. Um, and we welcome any other um, invitations or um, you know, communications from anyone who wants to talk further about these topics. Thanks. Thank you so Good much. Good luck. Gosh, that was uh, very informative, a lot for us to think about. So thank you very much. And as she said, Audrey will be posting a link for all the slides, but um, thank you very much for your time and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.